The Daniel J. Kane Religious Communication Award is presented by the University of Dayton to individuals who have made significant national or international contributions to the advancement of religious communications in the United States. The award is named after the former Director of Communications for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, who was a pioneer in Catholic communications and a prophetic national leader in social action. It is our honor to recognize Mr. Martin Dobelmeyer as the 2012 recipient of the Daniel J. Kane Award. Martin is the president and founder of Journey Films. He holds degrees in religious studies, broadcast journalism, and an honorary degree in fine arts. Since 1984, he has produced and directed more than 25 films focused on religion, faith, and spirituality. And over the past 20 years, he has traveled on location to over 40 countries to profile numerous religious leaders, religious communities, heads of state, and Nobel laureates. In addition to winning an Emmy for his documentary, Washington National Cathedral, Martin is a six-time winner of the prestigious Gabriel Award for best film on a topic of religion. The Gabriel Award is presented by the Catholic Academy for Communication Arts Professionals in the United States. Mr. Dobelmeyer is also a two-time winner of the top award from the Religious Communica Communicators Council, an interfaith association for religious communicators. The ability to raise social consciousness and communicate faith through film are powerful gifts and arts that Martin brings to his productions. Pope Benedict XVI, speaking to artists, called them the custodians of beauty. He said, you are the custodians of beauty. Thanks to your talent, you have the opportunity to speak to the heart of humanity, to touch individual and collective sensibilities, to call forth dreams and hopes, to broaden the horizons of knowledge and of human engagement. Through your art, you yourselves are to be heralds and witnesses of hope for humanity. These words clearly apply to the mission and vision of Martin Dobelmeyer. His documentaries examine how spiritual faith leads individuals to extraordinary action, how spirituality creates and sustains communities, and how religion evolves to meet the needs of a changing society. Three of his productions have been available to our UD classes and students in the past several weeks, The Power of Forgiveness, Bonhoeffer, and Bernadine. The interest and excitement of our university students who have viewed and discussed these films reflects the power of film to cultivate their moral imagination to learn, lead, and serve with a prophetic stance. The Daniel J. Kane Award is designed by artist Marianist brother Mel Meyer. The design captures the meaning of our baptismal call to discipleship. Through the waters of baptism, we are strengthened to witness to gospel values and live the cross prophetically in our lives. We believe that the design of the award reflects the dedication that Martin Dobelmeyer brings to his vocation as filmmaker. A donation is made in Martin's name to a scholarship fund to support individuals in the Caribbean and Asia in financial need so that they can participate in the virtual learning community for faith formation. On behalf of the president of the University of Dayton, Dr. Daniel J. Curran, and as dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, I present you, Martin, with the University of Dayton's 2012 Daniel J. Kane Religious Communication Award. Before Martin shares a few uh, ideas and thoughts about his, his vocation and his work, he has had put together a short video that sort of highlights the kind of work that he's been about, the kind of stories he has told, to put this all in context for us. There is a great mystery in the person with a terminal illness. 
who stands on the threshold between this life and what lies beyond. For some, the journey is a time of peace, while others do not go gentle into that good night. Hello, I'm Martin Doblmeyer. What we're about to explore is a paradox that as the body weakens and becomes more frail, there remains within each of us the potential for growth, the possibility of inner healing. For the person who's terminally ill, for their family and friends, that healing can become a final blessing. I think the most important thing that my uncle did was to realize from the start how evil Nazism was, then I think how brave it was of this small group of people to think that they could fight together with other companions, this monstrous machine, and that they were prepared to give their lives to do this. You can almost sense that eventually he is going to somehow do something to put a spoke in the wheel of the Third Reich. He could have such a very deep faith in God, even in the midst of incredible darkness. He was so clever and he knew so well theology and he knew all the points in which I was a weak man. I liked chocolate and he would bring me chocolate. He was my best friend. His grandson murdered this man's son. And today, they brought us all here in the power of compassion and forgiveness. And when we are introduced, this man's grandson killed this man's son. This is the first time in their young lives they've actually seen an alternative to violence. Mostly what they see in our culture is an eye for an eye. 20-year-old Tariq Kamisa was an art student at the University of San Diego. He was an honor student who worked part-time delivering pizzas. Tariq was a magnet, always a lot of friends, very charismatic. He loved life. He lived life very fully. He was an old soul in a young body. On the evening of January 21st, 1995, four teenagers who had been drinking and using drugs all day planned a robbery. They telephoned for a pizza, and when Tariq Kamisa arrived, a 14-year-old boy named Tony Hicks pointed a gun at him and demanded the pizza. When Tariq refused, Tony pulled the trigger and with a single shot, killed Tariq. Then, of course, the anger set in when I realized that he had been uh, killed over a pizza. It was uh, another child, 14-year-old, killing him. I think that's when it became uh, so senseless. At first, I did not believe that this was true. It's very difficult for parents to hear that their children die before they do. I'm an international investment banker, plays works for the city of San Diego as an enterprise manager. I mean, he grew up as a Baptist from the South, and I grew up as a Sufi Muslim. So I tell people, this is not Mother Teresa meeting the Dalai Lama. If he and I can come together, in spite of all of these differences, we can all do it. You've been asked by countries all over the world if you would send the missionaries of charity to their country. And yet, you've chosen to send your sisters to what is thought of as the richest country in the world, the United States. 
Is that because there is a poverty here that we have ignored? Uh, we don't have we don't have here poverty. Maybe hungry for a piece of bread. But many shutins and people who have been forgotten, who have left alone, who have been, who are lonely, who are who feel unwanted, unloved. I think that's a very great poverty and more difficult to remove, uh, to satisfy that hunger for love. Uh, it's much easier to give a hungry person a piece of bread and you have solved the difficulty. But a person who is hungry for love, for recognition, a little bit of joy, a little bit of compassion, I think that hunger takes longer time to satisfy. As a young boy, he dreamed of becoming a priest. As a man, Cardinal Leon Joseph Sunins became a central figure in the Second Vatican Council, one of the most important religious events of the 20th century. Under the glare of the world media, he helped guide an ancient institution in the struggle to renew itself. The other day in Canada, a journalist put me the question, is the Catholic Church in a state of revolution or in a state of evolution? And I had just one minute to answer. So I said, evolution should be a bit too weak, but revolution is too strong. Some believed he would one day be Pope. Many people thought, here Montini is already showing his successor. Paul VI showing students as the possible next Pope. And where could you be better, in a better place, to renew your faith, to renew your hope in the future, and to love each other like you never did before? But his visions for reform put him at odds with the church he loved. He loved this mother church. It was his reason for being. It was his first and last love. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks. Uh, I, you know, what uh, Sister Angela said a minute ago was that I put the reel together. I didn't, in fact, put the reel together. When the guys heard, in the, my office heard that I was coming out here to Dayton and that we wanted to show a clip reel, they said, well, well, we'll do the clip reel for you. Don't look at it. Just trust that it's going to be there. And so I think I have to teach one of them how you spell Mother Teresa. Did you, <laughs> did you see that? <laughs> So, and I think that I heard them downstairs laughing because they were looking at me from 30 years ago. Who says this business doesn't age a man? <laughs> so, I, I want to say thanks uh, for the invitation to be here at this university, this historic university. I've been here on a number of occasions, but not for many years, and so it's a pleasure to be back here with you. And in particular, I want to say a real thank you to Sister Angela Ann, who's been a friend for many years. And uh, I guess it was a number of weeks ago, she invited me to Skype 
into her class. I'm sure you all know what that is. I, I sit in my office and look at a computer, and it's sent somehow with technology I don't really understand to her location, and I was able to speak to the students there. And it was quite a lot of fun. But now having watched what you folks are all about over these last, uh, these couple of days, uh, I, th I see that's just the beginning of what you all are doing because the technology is here to do so many things. And so where I'm a religion communicator, I think there's so many connections between what I do in the religion communication world, which I'll talk about tonight, and what you do in the terms of education, that sense of reaching out and using every tool that's available. And the, and the third thing, too, for me is that uh, I knew Dan Kane. I did not know him well, but I began this work, as you saw, in 1980. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, I knew him, and I certainly knew his commitment to religious communications, to communicating the gospel values. And to me, that was really inspiring. I was, you know, I was a young man when I started doing this work in uh, 1980. I just had ideas about what I wanted to try and accomplish. Uh, Dan was already a senior and a veteran at all of this, and uh, he was an inspiration for everybody. So to get an award this evening that continues his legacy for me is a great honor. Um, I said I began this really in 1980. I'll tell you a little behind the scenes. I'm a little silly, I guess, but we'll take a chance. Um, the clip that you saw with Mother Teresa, I had in 1980 um, received the first, really at the time, the largest grant ever given out by the Catholic Communication Campaign. I had this idea to create a television series called Real to Real. Mother Teresa had won the year before the Nobel Prize for Peace to announce to the world that works of love were genuinely works of peace. And so I knew I wanted her to be one of the stories in Real to Real. So before the check to start Real to Real, I received the confirmation we were going to do this, but I'd never received any money. You know how slowly the church works, right? <laughs> so the check didn't have, wasn't going to come for a while, frankly. But I went to New York from Washington, D.C., from our home in Washington, D.C., to New York to uh, meet with the missionaries of charity because I wanted to tell them that I really wanted a, a story on Mother Teresa. And I spent a couple of days with the provincial, a wonderful, saintly woman whose name was Sister Priscilla Lewis. And at the end of the two days, when I was with her, talking to her about what my ideas were, and I, I knew I didn't have a, really much of a shot at this, but I was going to try anyway. She said, just let it go for now, and if it's God's will, it'll, it'll happen. So I went home. A couple of weeks later, I'm in the shower. I never like to answer the phone. When, when I'm in the shower, but I just, when the phone rang, I thought, I should do this, I don't know. So I answered the phone, I'm, I'm standing here, and I hear this angelic voice on the other end say to me, Martin, this is Sister Priscilla Lewis. And I, I'm standing there naked, and I'm all, all I'm, I must have turned cardinal red, and, and I said, I, I'm lucky we weren't Skyping, and, and she said, <laughs> and she says, she said, Martin, I've talked to Mother Teresa, and she's approved you to come and do the interview with her. I said, well, this is really unbelievable. I, I'm so thrilled. But it's going to be a number of weeks, maybe even months, before we get a staff on board and equipment and everything else. And I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do it, but it's going to be a while. She says, no, no, no. Mother Teresa's here right now in New York. And if you can be here the day after tomorrow, you can do the interview. Oh, but sister, I don't know. If it's God's will, you'll be here. She hangs up the phone. And I did. Right then and there I began. I called one friend. I got a camera from one person and microphones from somebody else. And day after tomorrow, I was actually in New York. We spent two glorious days with Mother Teresa. But the reason I tell that is because, for me, the privilege of doing that, I'll never, you know, I, that day was, just, those days were unforgettable for me. And in some ways, I think, really a confirmation that maybe I might be onto something here that was important. But that whole notion of the will of God, that whole idea, and I think in some ways, that was the stamp, that first day, the whole notion of the will of God. And for me, the whole idea of communications is listening and being attentive to the notion of the will of God, and then communicating it through story. That's what we do in terms of the art of communication is the art of listening to what the will of God is and how it's being activated in the people who are living right here and now with us. And then transferring that into story. My medium is film. And I have to say, what I've learned over the years is that film is not, and television is not an easy medium for this kind of work. It's not. Television does a great job when it comes to sports events and fashion and things that are, that are visual, that you can see them right there on the screen. The interior life 
That's a much more challenging thing to tell, much more challenging. And in particular in our culture today, I have to say, it's a really difficult time. When I began this work, um, television knew it should be giving a place to religion every week. A lot of the times when we had Reel to Reel, we were actually showing it during public service time. That was understood, that religion had a place on television. When you saw a clergyman or a woman in habit, you, you saw them as a good person. I'll boldly say that today in our culture, when you see a, a person, a religion person, you see them on a drama, my guess is they're gonna turn out to be the bad guy. Am I right? That's happening time and time again. And the other thing that I find interesting too is that when I started this work, I remember in, in uh, commercial television stations, when they wanted to know what you were thinking, when they had gatherings, sort of like survey groups, they would ask you, what do you like? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite holiday? And they do something very different today. Today, I can't say if it's because of we, we live in this post 9-11 generation. We've been at war now for almost a decade. The question they ask you today is, what do you fear? What are your fears? You tell me what you fear, and I'll tell you what will be on the evening news tonight. What happens to your child after you drop them off at daycare tonight at 11? What's really in the bottled water that you're drinking? The full details on our show. This is a generation that really talks first about fear. And now here we come as people of faith with stories that we think hopefully can inspire. And, and I want to say too, and I'll, I'll say this with some reservation, but it's absolutely true. I think a lot of what's happened too in the media over the last 10 years because of the scandals in this church have made it even more difficult for us to come forward and talk about the positive because a lot of people watch television today and they've got other things that are going on, other images that are already clearly there in their minds. And I hear them talk to me about this all the time. And yet, I have to say, day after day, year after year, after year if you can tell a good story that inspires, it still communicates to people. It still does. They want to hear those stories. When I did the story, The Power of Forgiveness, I traveled around the country for about six months with the film, doing churches and large organizations, and every night, every night, people would come up to me afterwards and say how inspired they were. And in particular, to see a story about a Muslim person who, and you know what's happened, you know, how often Muslims feel as though the media has just taken them taken them apart. But they would see a story about a Muslim man who had decided, even at the, at the, at the loss of his only son, to take that, act, that tragedy and to turn it into an act of forgiveness and reconciliation with the, with the grandfather or the boy who had killed his own son. Night after night, people would come to me and say that their lives had been touched and transformed, not by me, but by the story that they had seen on the television screen. I'll tell you, one of my favorite stories really goes back, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an old Jewish story. There was a great rabbi at the turn of the century, the last century, who lived in, in a rural area in, in Europe. His name was Rabbi Kamen. And Rabbi Kamen was known by everybody in his village as a brilliant scholar of the Talmud and the Torah. But in particular, he was loved because he put the people before the law. And because he put the people before the law, the people loved him. Now, there was to be a trial on the other end of the county, and the lawyer for the trial, well, he needed somebody to come as a character witness. So he calls on Rabbi Kamen. And Rabbi Kamen comes to the trial, and the lawyer introduces the rabbi to the judge and to the court by saying, this is the rabbi who's an honored man, a very loving, caring man. In fact, the lawyer says, they tell a story in the rabbi's village that one day the rabbi came home and he saw a robber in his house whose arms were completely filled with his goods. And when the robber saw the homeowner, he ran out the door and fled down the street. And the rabbi chased him down the street, shouting at the top of his lungs, anyone who can hear my voice, I tell you, the things this man carries, they belong to no one. And in this way, the robber could never be accused of stealing anyone's possessions. The judge looks at the lawyer and says, that's a great story. Do you believe it? And the lawyer says, I don't know, but they don't tell stories like that about you and me. And isn't that what this is all about? In many ways, for me, the, the notion of the communication of a story that they can inspire and bring people to something really different. That, I think, is what this is all about. For us, as Christians, 
Who is the master storyteller? Christ. I heard somebody whispering. Don't whisper. Jesus Christ, whose stories 2,000 years ago we still tell every day, don't we? The parables of the mustard seed, parables of the prodigal son. The prodigal son story, um, 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 Henry Nouwen says, the great writer Henry Nouwen says that in the story of the prodigal son is everything that Jesus ever wanted to teach us and everything we ever needed to know. But the real interesting thing to me is that after telling all the stories, after enlivening the stories, Christ was already designated to become the story, to be the story. And in many ways, I think that's the most important challenge for all of us. If you're an educator, a communicator, fundamentally a storyteller, you're not challenged just to communicate the story. You're challenged to become changed yourself by the story that you tell. I could have, I have a degree in journalism, and I could have gone into a form of journalism whereby I stand at a distance from the subject matter, which is what I'm supposed to do as a journalist. And I made a decision a long time ago, I couldn't do that. I am responsible for my own soul. And so as I tell these stories and communicate these ideas and this inspirational message, the truth of the matter is I have to accept the fact that I'm called, just like everybody else, to answer to the God who made me and to be transformed like everybody else into the stories that we're doing. For me, that's the most important thing. And what are we supposed to do? What, how are we supposed to live? If there's one biblical reference that I use almost every day, it's the one from Micah. What are we supposed to do? We are supposed to, we're, you know, we're supposed to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Do justice. I'm old enough, and I sense some of you here as I look around might be old enough too, to remember the images of Catholic priests and, ca and nuns walking side by side in Selma, Alabama. Was it not the Catholic Church who told Cesar Chavez, we will stand, we'll put our institution behind you and make something special. The church knows about justice. To do mercy. Christians didn't invent forgiveness. We know that. But in a sense, it's the hallmark of who we are supposed to be, that sense of mercy is connected with justice, and in the end, we walk humbly with our God. And for me, that's a wonderful image. Not behind, three steps behind, walk side by side, humbly, right there with our God. And so for me this evening, uh, to receive an award named after Dan Kane, who's someone I knew and really respected, to be in the company of you folks and Sister Angela Ann for all that you're doing, and I'm humbled by what you've done for me this evening. It's really a lovely award. And I will tell you, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, for the next week, I'll stand a little taller, I'll work a little harder for you, I'll do everything I can to tell stories and communicate things that can inspire. And I think you as educators know that's your job too. So thank you all, and God bless you. <laughs>